Hello! We're back with another Why They Hate the USA, going through why various countries dislike American foreign policy and government as a direct result of American actions in and around said countries. This hatred very rarely extends to regular American people, who are likewise victims of the same oppressive structures in other ways, despite at times being beneficiaries of the carnage and interventions the US carries out globally. Today's country is Iran. With an ancient cultural heritage going back thousands of years and boasting the oldest declaration of human rights by Cyrus the Great, this West Asian nation is currently home to approximately 87 million people. For brevity's sake, we'll start with the 20th century, specifically 1921, during which the British supported a coup by Colonel Reza Shah against the last monarch of the Qajar dynasty. It was not a normal coup, however, and while Reza was really in charge from his post as Minister of War, this odd power structure remained in place for only about four years till 1925, when he was crowned monarch. As will become a theme in this video, the motivating factor for this coup was, of course, oil. World War II had dramatically changed Britain's priorities and in the late 1941, they made a deal with USSR to split Iran in two in order to prevent Iranian oil from getting into Nazi hands. The Red Army would invade from the north and the British would invade from the south. Following World War II, the USSR, per their agreement with Britain, withdrew from Iran. The British, however, didn't. After securing Iranian oil from Britain moving forward, they quote-unquote granted Iran independence. It is at this time that the United States, Britain's BFF and daddy, became interested in Iran's internal affairs because of, well, oil, again. It's a meme for a reason. During the 1949 parliamentary elections, the issue of nationalizing the Anglo-Iranian oil company was the number one issue on people's minds. As a result, many politicians in favor of nationalization, a group called the National Front, were elected by the Mejdis, the Iranian parliament. One politician in particular, Mohammad Mossadegh, helped to pass a bill officially nationalizing the AIOC in 1951. Negotiations with Britain deteriorated following the passage of this bill, and they pressured the Shah to appoint a series of British-friendly prime ministers, all of whom failed. Iran's exercise of sovereignty over their own resources was unacceptable to the UK, so they had to get involved. Back to the video in just a second, let's hear from Keeps. Male pattern baldness is a genetic condition that affects two out of every three guys by the time they are 35. Get professional care for hair loss from the comfort of your home, without ever visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy. I am currently a hospital doctor, but a million years ago I worked within family medicine and met the occasional patient hoping to get treatment for their hair loss. That's where services like Keeps come in. Keeps is a convenient hair loss treatment where you can complete an online consultation to get matched with a provider who will tailor a treatment plan, if medically appropriate, to address your hair loss concerns. How exactly? Well, Keeps products are formulated using certain treatments that are FDA approved, have shown clinical results and are in regular clinical use. All treatment plans are personalized to address your unique needs and recommended by a licensed medical professional specially trained in men's hair loss. Treatments is delivered right to your door on your schedule, with the flexibility of 3, 6, and 12 month delivery options. Plus, you can adjust, pause, or cancel your plan at any time. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. Most Keeps men notice results within 6 months of starting treatment. So what are you waiting for? Go down to the description and click my link for a special offer. Individual results may vary, of course. With over 5,000 reviews, over 1 million men treated, and a discreet delivery plan, you can start your hair loss treatment today. Go to keeps.com slash Hakeem or the link in the description and get started. Thanks for Keeps for the sponsorship, it allows me to pay my rent fairly, which is very appreciated. Alright, back to the video. Mosaddegh, after being nominated for the role of Prime Minister, would only follow through if the Mejdis voted to approve the law he would draw up that would actually implement the nationalization they had recently approved and create the National Iranian Oil Company. The Mejdis approved it unanimously, and Mosaddegh was now Prime Minister. Seeing that the British were adamant about their imperialist claims to Iran's oil reserves, Mosaddegh cut off diplomatic relations with Britain in 1952. This was the final straw. Since the UK no longer had an embassy in Iran, they asked the US to overthrow Mosaddegh for them. The US, of course, agreed. Unbeknownst to the UK, however, the US was doing so for its own gain, not altruism towards the UK, unsurprisingly. The US gave this task to the CIA, who assigned agent, I kid you not, Kermit Roosevelt. <laughs> Anyways, this was the grandson of former US President Theodore Roosevelt. Codenamed Ajax, the aim of the operation was to remove Mossadegh and replace him with a Western-friendly successor who will sign away Iranian national resources to the United States. Luckily for the CIA, decades of British colonialism had provided them with several experienced and resourceful Iranian assets, such as sympathetic politicians, military officers, clergymen, newspaper editors, and street gang leaders, in addition to their own Iranian assets. The CIA paid each of these operatives tens of thousands of dollars per month, which would be worth hundreds of thousands per month in today's money. 
After Roosevelt's first attempt to remove Mossadegh failed, Roosevelt consulted General Norman Schwarzkopf, who advised him to use the CIA to pay protesters to riot and appear to be pro-Mossadegh so as to give pretext for CIA assets in key places in the Iranian military to remove him. This second attempt, which began immediately after the failure, did eventually succeed, but not until a long and bloody struggle outside his home. The Shah was now in total control of the country. The US-backed coup led to a substantial depreciation in the power of the Mejdis, which allowed the Shah a freer hand to rule autocratically. First order of business was to declare martial law. He then strengthened the feared Savak, the Shah's brutal secret police force, and charged them with suppressing all opposition and dissent within Iran. With Mossadegh gone, an American, British and European gang of companies, collectively known as the Iranian Oil Participants Limited, descended on Iranian oil, accepting, quote unquote, accepting, a 50-50% revenue split in the interest of oil barons. In order for the Shah to have some face saved, the agreement nominally recognized the nationalization, but the IOP controlled production levels and pricing, leaving the NIOC to only have control over distribution within Iran. Basically, the Shah gave up the hard-won sovereignty over Iranian oil. Unsurprisingly, this was highly unpopular with the public. In addition to controlling Iran's oil, the US helped prop up the Shah's new government under General Zahadi by providing $43 million in economic assistance, equivalent to around $500 million today. In 1955, Iran joined the colonial Baghdad Pact, later known as the Central Treaty Organization, following Iraq's withdrawal from the pact in 1958, because we're based. This was a defense treaty including Iraq, Turkey, and Pakistan. The United Kingdom and the United States served as observer members, because they're always right next door, I guess. Income inequality grew, discrimination against the religious, the vast majority of the Iranian population by official organs was widespread, and opportunities for rural communities dwindled as a bloated royal family siphoned off wealth for their western patrons and took what was left for themselves. As discontent grew, a certain clergyman named Khomeini was gaining prominence. He had been arrested several times in the 1960s for staunch outspokenness against the government and the Shah. Following his arrest in June of 1963, riots in favor of Khomeini broke out. This riot would lead to Khomeini's exile the following year to Iraq and eventually France. Amid economic turmoil, the Shah continued to make ever more desperate moves. Violent suppression of the ever-growing protests against the Shah and the human rights violations taking place in Savak prisons didn't help. Khomeini was leading a growing opposition movement that was becoming a serious political force throughout the 1970s. Khomeini returned to Iran to a crowd of millions of supporters on February 1st, 1979. While Khomeini was one of the more popular figures during the time of the revolution, another was the communists of the Tibet party, who were united against the Shah. The United States is watching this unfold and is of course extremely nervous about the prospect of a socialist Iran, which would then become another ally of the USSR, naturally. Presented with this choice, the United States decided to support the movement led by Khomeini by supplying his group with arms. On February 11th, Khomeini's forces had taken control over key points in the capital. Students filled with zeal during all of this fervor headed to the United States Embassy in Tehran, which was filled with a few staff members as well as over 50 CIA agents manically shredding all of the detailed documentation about how the US pulled off the coup against Mossadegh in 1953. Unfortunately for those agents, the students would make their way into the embassy and hold them hostage until 1981. Called the Iran hostage crisis, it became a pivotal moment in US-Iran relations. During the 444-day crisis, students and various militant groups negotiated with the US, beginning with Jimmy Carter and his administration who flatly refused to give anything in return for the hostages. These were overwhelmingly CIA assets that the US didn't want to acknowledge the existence of, given the work they had been carrying out for decades. In fact, so impotent was Tehran to the CIA that it became the headquarters for all CIA operations in Asia, and it was provided the minting plates for $20 bills. The latter fact is fairly astounding since minting plates are only provided to Federal Reserve branches and only in the US. The reason for the CIA having this ability to mint $20 bills is due to the obscene amount of money they need to carry out operations and bribes before the era of electronic wire transfers. Anyway, upon catching these CIA agents shredding massive amounts of evidence, middle and high school students came together to piece together the ripped up paper like a puzzle. They were successful and now had a treasure trove of documents spelling out in excruciating detail who, when, where, why, and how the 1953 coup was carried out. They immediately made these documents freely available to the world, still the US wouldn't budge. The decade and Jimmy Carter's term would end with a brand new conflict brewing and, of course, the US needed to be involved in it. Immediately following the revolution, the then leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, praised Khomeini's revolution seeking good ties with Iran following the overthrow of the Shah. 
However, Khomeini wasn't fond of Saddam or his government, for discriminatory religious reasons, and instead of thanking him, called for a similar revolution in Iraq which would grant control of Iraq over to Iran, a historic tendency of Persian expansionism no matter the ideological justification. Iran started border raids into Iraq, which Iraq publicly complained of to the UN with hundreds of incidents to no avail. Iran continued, with the organization of clandestine cells in Iran carrying out a campaign of attacks, bombings and raids inside Iraqi territory, with the most famous example being the bomb attack targeting Iraq's Christian Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz in the University of Mustansariya. Iraq responded to these events with a final protest note warning the Iranians that their military incursions and attacks would be met with retaliatory military action. Following no response, Iraq launched preemptive military action, a warning against supporting an Iranian-style Islamic quote-unquote Islamic revolution in Iraq, and it was clearly planned on being rather limited in scope to all observers. However, the limited military operation turned into a bloody full-scale eight-year-long war. That's a story for another day though. While Khomeini accepted US help to get into power, his preaching turned anti-American pretty quickly, mostly because the vast mass of Iranians were themselves anti-imperialist. During the Reagan regime in the United States, relations between the two countries deteriorated to the point where the US officially sold weapons to Iraq, but unofficially, clandestine efforts to sell missiles to Iran were underway in a controversy known as the Iran-Contra Affair. The US profiteering by selling weapons to both sides of a conflict is a tale as old as time, given its status as a major arms dealer on the world stage. Meanwhile, a democratically elected leftist government took power in Nicaragua. Reagan's government didn't like this, of course, so they arranged CIA assets and US military materiel to arm right-wing death squads, known as the Contras in Nicaragua, while appearing to follow the recently passed law explicitly forbidding the United States from providing arms to said Contras. For those unaware, the Contras were a brutal reactionary, counter-revolutionary movement opposing the democratically elected FSLN, commonly known as the Sandinistas. The gist of the plan was as such. The US would sell Iran missiles and other arms in exchange for the release of hostages, take the money from those sales to fund the Contras in Nicaragua so that the money used in the latter could not be tied to governmental accounting, thereby technically following the aforementioned law. Additionally, the US government collected donations from wealthy Americans and secretly transferred those funds to the Contras. Iran was to receive 100 anti-tank missiles, but in order to mask the fact that they were US supplied, the actual transfer of arms went between Israel and Iran. Reagan would go on to deny any knowledge of these operations after a leaked memo broke the story, causing the well-known scandal. In New York City, a plane has crashed right into the world. On my order. The United States military has begun strikes against Al Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Fast forward to the early 2000s. After 9/11, the United States responded by going to war with Afghanistan later in the year. In 2003, the US would illegally and under fabricated pretenses invade and criminally occupy Iraq. During this time, US President George W. Bush was often making unhinged nationalistic speeches, enjoying record high approval rates, and generally beating his chest on the national stage. Just before invading Iraq, he made his famous 2002 State of the Union address, wherein he first referred to Iraq, Iran, and the DPRK as an axis of evil. If it's a bad thing, then why does it have such a cool name? The claim about Iran specifically was that the country aggressively pursues these WMDs and exports terror, while an unelected few repress the Iranian people's hope for freedom, which is an excellent example of every accusation is a confession. But I digress. While the US had sanctioned Iran in 1979 under the pretense that Iran was supporting terrorism, the modern sanctions regime against Iran began in 2006 with UN Security Council Resolution 1737. In 2015, the UN Security Council facilitated an agreement between Iran, China, France, Germany, Russia, the UK, and the US. The aim of this agreement, according to US President Obama, was a comprehensive long-term deal with Iran that will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The actual agreement was weak, but was touted as a major win for the administration. Only three years later, Trump would pull the United States out of the deal. Since 2016, US-Iran relations have backslid dramatically. After Trump pulled the US out of the nuclear deal in 2018, he almost immediately imposed sanctions he claimed were aimed at forcing Iran to dramatically alter its policies in the region, including its support for militant groups across the Middle East and its development of ballistic missiles. Not a flaccid effort at regime change. In 2019, the US said it would sanction anyone that buys Iranian oil in an effort to further kneecap their economy. Not yet content with making the lives of Iranians absolutely miserable, the US attempted to force other nations to comply with armed sanctions in 2020. However, these sanctions were new and many countries had to explain in no uncertain terms that the US doesn't have the legal authority to force them to abide by this particular set of sanctions. 
The new sanctions were against 27 individuals and entities, including officials at the Iranian Ministry of Defense, nuclear scientists, the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, and anyone found trading in conventional weapons with Iran. Later in 2020, one more round of sanctions was leveled at Iran, this time at the financial sector targeting 18 Iranian banks in an effort to further shut down Iran out of the global banking system. The sanctions regime against Iran is unconscionable and amounts to collective punishment of the Iranian people despite the claim from the US to the contrary, and unfortunately there is no end of them in sight. Interesting that another country in the region, actually responsible for terror, has no such sanctions or limitations placed onto it, at least not yet. Since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, more and more Iranian-developed and manufactured Shahid drones are being used by Russia to carry out strikes. Of course, US media hypes up the use of these drones despite them being far from the decisive or even major factor in Russian operations. The connections to the US here are actually really funny. Some Iranian drones appear to contain parts from more than a dozen US companies, which is damning evidence that the aforementioned sanctions regime isn't stronger than the capitalist desire for profits. The US as always plans to do their best to harm the people of Iran, as they do with any nation that doesn't follow US foreign policy desires and doesn't agree to have American companies endlessly exploit their natural resources. I'm too lazy to formulate this next part into a more coherent thing, so here's basically just a slideshow of all the times basically mainstream American media called for attacking, nuking, or bombing, or basically militarily destroying Iran. Enjoy. If anything, this just reinforces another quote from the great helmsman. US imperialism is the most ferocious enemy of the people of the entire world. The core of that enemy, however, is capitalism. You don't need to like Iran to realize that they should not be sanctioned or attacked by imperialists day in and day out. A great book recommendation for further reading is All the Shah's Men by Stephen Kinzer. That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, it really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to Nitro Dubs, Kenny, Thomas Roberts, Nicholas, Owen Baker, T. Wood, Dr. Lemon Man, Lumix, Charlie and Eric, Ultimate Turin, Daniel Ethel, The Generic Guy, Santiago Pereira, Rain, Cassandra Corvus, David Fries, Confuse M, Mariana Mastosevich, Robbie Richardson, and Masei Kadro. Thanks for watching!